Well, good evening, everyone. I apologize for my tardiness. Um, a few of the urgent matters in the rector's office today crowded out the important matter, which was coming to be here and talk with you about the church, and I ask your forgiveness on that. Um, this is our last class. This is um, number five of five. Uh, some of you are going through this for the first time. Some of you are my regulars. Uh, so I'm going to see if we can't reserve a little bit of time at the end uh, for questions just about anything uh, on the agenda for this whole course. But the last piece of our work, the thing that we need to sort of put together now is how is it that we make decisions in the community of faith or polity for a more technical term. If you're following along in your service sheets, we're on page 11. If you believe it, we've uh, covered all that ground in 11. And if you remember where we started, we spent the first two classes talking about the Bible and how we interpret the Bible, getting to know that handbook of Christian living, as I like to call it. Then in the third session, we talked about church history and theology. How do we make sense of what we read in the Bible? How do we understand God? How do we put that all together? And then in the fourth session, we talked about liturgy, the particular way that Episcopalians and Anglicans pray that sets us apart from other people. We're also set apart from other people and other Christian communities in the way that we govern ourselves. My friend Stephen Cook is the senior pastor of Second Baptist Church directly across the street, uh, and he likes to say, only half-joking, that he is never more than one congregational meeting away from unemployment. Because in the Baptist tradition, each congregation is sovereign, and each congregation will make decisions for itself, and a vote of the congregation is enough to change whatever policy uh, they want to change or change out whatever staff they want to change. That's not how we function over here. The Episcopal Church functions as a republic, not as a democracy. Can somebody tell me the difference? This is like ninth grade civics here, so we're all digging back far. What's the difference between a republic and a democracy? There, say, it, say it again. Okay. Uh-huh. And in a republic? That's right. In democracy, the people decide. In a republic, the people decide who are the people who are going to make decisions for them. So in the uh, congregational church, we have a vestry, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And the only vote that you, as members of Church of the Holy Communion, take every year is to elect your representatives on the vestry. And the vestry will then take the policy decisions. They'll pass the budget, they'll work with me, they do my annual review, uh, they'll set policy around this or that, uh, and that's the vestry's obligation and responsibility. But let's go back to uh, where we started uh, with the Bible and talk about how the Bible organizes the church. In session number two, I gave you a fun church word that you can all be very proud uh, that you know called eschatology. Eschatology. And who can give me a definition of eschatology? End times. That's the eschatos or the eschaton is the end times. And what does ology mean? Hmm, does it really? It actually means words about, technically. Uh, ology comes from the Greek word logos, which means word. So theology, words about God. Biology, words about uh, bodies, about living creatures. That's what the ologies all mean. So eschatology is words about the end of time. What is your understanding of how all this comes to an end? And what was Paul's eschatology? Tell me about St. Paul's eschatology. Imminent. Imminent. That's exactly right. St. <clears throat> Paul thought that Jesus was coming tomorrow. St. Paul would not make a non-refundable um, hotel reservation for this weekend because he thought that Jesus was coming between now and then. Paul felt that he might have out weeks at the most, maybe months, to tell the entire known world about what's going on with Jesus. All those churches that he settled in the Acts of the Apostles, he's going around because he thinks Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And all of those letters are written to the churches that he left behind because he didn't have time to stay and chair their vestry meetings and deal with their concerns. And so he wrote to them 
and prayed for them, but he went on. Now, if we were to say that St. Paul wrote every letter that bears his name, and this was another piece that we talked about authorship in session two, if it is the case that Paul wrote every word that bears his name, how do you think Paul would organize the church? How do you think Paul would organize the church? Exactly correct. St. Paul would not organize the church. St. Paul would want the church just to get get together and work it out. Some of uh, St. Paul's comments on uh, slavery and other things that we sort of have to wrestle with now are sort of saying, it's only going to be a couple more days. It's almost done. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine because it's going to be all over by the weekend. But then, of course, 2,000 years later, here we are trying to make sense of it all. So let's walk to a letter that uh, bears St. Paul's name, 1 Timothy. I'm going to read from chapter 3. And this is one of the uh, suggestions that we have that Paul may not have written everything that bears his name. Because 1 Timothy bears St. Paul's name, but you'll see that he goes into great detail about how the church should be organized. 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 to 13. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil." Hello, Bishop. How are you this evening? I was actually just talking to the Bishop before I came into this room. So we actually are in the process of electing a Bishop. Bishop Don Johnson, pictured here, is uh, going to retire in May of 2019, and we're in the process of gathering feedback so that a committee can put together a profile so that some priests who want to be bishops just leave that there, some priests who want to be bishops can uh, put their names forward for consideration and be considered. Uh, I went to two of the listening sessions with the search committee. I've talked to several members of the search committee, and none of them seem to be using this standard. (laughs) Tell me how your children behave at school. That's going to be a qualification. Tell me all these things. What we're going to gather from this letter is that the office of a bishop being a bishop is a high calling. It's an important trust and responsibility, and it needs to be something that we take seriously. Let's talk about deacons for a moment. Deacons, likewise, must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and let them first be tested. And then if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Women, likewise, must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be married only once. Let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve as deacons gain a good standing For themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Hello, Randy. Lovely of you to be with us today. So, we have these two different kinds of ministers who are set apart, and both of them have these long lists of credentials. I, always to- I told you back when we were doing scriptural interpretation in session number two that what you want to go for is what's the core truth in the scripture. 
And the core truth of the Scripture is we need good, responsible, honorable people to take leadership in the church. It's not something that should be taken on lightly, and it's not something that we should approach lightly. That's where I look to that. In the historical church, in the historical church, there are three orders of ministry, three kinds of ordained leaders for the church. We've already talked about two of them, bishops and deacons. This is a picture of um, Bishop Johnson, our diocesan bishop. It's a picture of Randy McCloy, our parish deacon. So we've got two orders of ministry that are mentioned in 1 Timothy. But you may have encountered some ordained people who don't fit one of those two categories. Who doesn't fit the two categories? The priests, exactly. That's right. I'm glad you thought of that so quickly. I was uh, my old glasses in that picture. Um, The priests, I wouldn't have had a job in the first century church. I wouldn't have had a job. So let's talk about these three, and we'll come back to me last. So in the early church, we have bishops and we have deacons. The Greek word for bishop, or the Greek word from which we derive the word bishop, is episkopos, episkopos, which may sound familiar to you in this Episcopal church. Episcopos means overseer, or superintendent. The bishop, the episcopos, the overseer, is the one who sort of looks out for the whole flock. He's the one who makes sure that uh, he's paying attention to what's coming over the next hill. He's the sheepdog running around the sides to make sure that everybody stays in bounds. That's the role of the bishop. The role of the deacon, diakonoi, is the word for servant, a server who carries out something on behalf of another. In the early church, it was the role of the bishop to preside and to oversee and to direct, and it was the role of the deacon to carry on the church's ministry. So each local church would have a deacon who would administer the funds and take care of the alms and reach out to people who were in need. It was a servant order. And then each uh, regional area would have a bishop, and the bishop would come around and would do the sacramental things and would make policy decisions and sort of manage the operation. So this was how it worked. We had the bishops and the deacons. But then as the church got larger, and particularly as we entered into the Constantinian period where it became the law in Rome that you be a Christian, we had lots of little churches springing up. And it became more and more difficult for bishops to go around to all of these little churches and uh, do all the sacramental work. There could be no Holy Eucharist unless the bishop was there. There could be no baptism unless the bishop was there. There could be no blessing of of a marriage unless the bishop was there. There could be no forgiveness of sins unless the bishop were there. And as the church grew and grew, this became progressively more unsustainable. So a bunch of bishops got together and said, well, here's what we're going to do. We are going to ordain some people to do some of this stuff on our behalf, but not all of it. We're going to keep some of these things for ourselves. And all the other bishops said, that's great, that's great, that's excellent, that's exactly what we're going to do. Then they said, so who are we going to do? Who are we going to get to do this? And they could have said, we're going to go out to the congregation and grab some folks and say, Liz, you are now the elder of the congregation, and you will oversee this, and you can do certain things on my behalf. That was one option. But the option they chose is they said, you know, we've got all these people as deacons in the church who are already exercising leadership in the congregation. They're already in charge of the money. They're already carrying out the mission. Let's have them be the sacramental officers as well. And that was the track that the church chose. And so to this day, every priest of the church must first be ordained as a deacon because it is only from the order of deacons that we take our presbyters, our elders of the congregation. If you walk into Hester or my office down the hall, you'll see that each of us has a pair of ordination certificates on the wall. It's great for the gifts. People want to send you a gift for ordination, here's something lovely and generous, and then you send them another invitation six months later, and then they have to send you another gift. It just it stacks it all up for you. 
Hester and I have a pair. Each of us has a pair of ordination certificates on the wall. Deacon Randy only has one. We all entered into the order of deacons. Randy will spend his entire career there. Hester and I moved on to the order of priests. In the same way, whoever it is that God calls to be the next bishop of West Tennessee will currently be a priest. Not necessarily here, but somewhere will be a priest. And so the idea is that these orders vest. You put one on, and then you put the next one on like an overcoat, and then you put the next one on like an overcoat over that. The word priest derives from the Greek presbytros, which means elder, elder. You can tell a lot about churches uh, and how they organize themselves by the names that they give themselves. So when I say presbyter, what does that sound like? Presbyterian, right? And if you were a Presbyterian, your elder of your congregation would gather together with the elders of other congregations, and that's going to be the governing body. It's called the presbytery, right? It focuses on that elder. But we are an Episcopal church, Episcopos, focused on bishops. We're that church with bishops, one of my professors used to say, us and the Catholics. Catholic, by the way, means universal. Um, and, but they are also Episcopal, and we are also Catholic. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just how you choose to use the words. So this is what we have, three orders of ordained ministry. There's an important concept that we get out of the 79 Book of Common Prayer that tells us that people who are ordained are not set above each other or set above the congregation, but set apart. Set apart, not set above. Remember where it started. The bishops needed somebody to fill in for them in between times. And that's my job, is to fill in for the bishop when he can't be here. Come uh, April 22nd, April 22nd, Bishop Johnson is making his annual visitation to Holy Communion. And what you'll notice is that Randy has a role in the service, and Hester and I sit on the side. Because when the bishop is around, he's in charge. We're not needed because our only job is to fill in when he's not here. So for those of you who are pursuing confirmation, um, I will stand behind you and put my hand on your shoulder, and then I'm going to go sit back in my chair. But the bishop is going to run the service that day, because I'm not needed. Let's see. So I've given you three orders of ministry, but there's one missing. Anybody tell me which order of ministry is missing? Say it again. Lay men or lay people? Lay people, perhaps. Lay people. And I would say that this is the first order of ministry. The prayer book, by the way, would say that it is the first order of ministry. Uh, when you look in the back of the prayer book, there's a section called the Catechism, which is this interesting question and answer back and forth about the beliefs of the Episcopal Church, uh, ri written in really straightforward language. One of those questions is, who are the ministers of the church? And the answer to the question is, the ministers of the church are lay people, bishops, priests, and deacons. In that order. Lay people, bishops, priests, and deacons. Particularly in the new um, prayer book, the new prayer book, it's older than I am, but the new prayer book, where baptism is so central and so emphasized, this is the first order. This is the order that you enter by virtue of your baptism. And if that's the first garment that you put on, if these orders vest, this is the first garment that you put on. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in the prayers? Will you respect the dignity of every human being? These are the promises that we make when we become Christians. When you're baptized, they're made, you make them or they're made on your behalf. When you con are confirmed, you'll make them again. And then when you're ordained a deacon, you put on some additional responsibility. And when you're ordained a priest, you put on some additional responsibility. And when you're ordained a bishop, you put on some additional responsibility. But it all starts with those fundamental responsibilities. And I would argue to you, and this is an editorial comment, you have no business moving to the next order until you have figured out the first, at least to a reasonable extent. Any priest who doesn't see value in the servant ministry of the deacons, whose responsibility is to carry forward the mission of the church into the world, in my view, has no business presiding over the church. 
And any person who presumes to carry the church's mission forward but can't first handle the baptismal covenant and the promise to respect the dignity of every person and the promise to pray and the promise to worship has no business in ordained ministry. And I would argue, anyone who has not run a parish church for a good long while has no business being a bishop. But we're just going to leave that aside. So it's this idea that you need to figure out the one before in order to move into the next. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Comments? Thoughts? Ah, very good question. So Don is just asking, where do some other terms come in, like curate or vicar or rector, perhaps? Or canon, even better. Um, or dean, perhaps. So what we have are four orders of ministry, and the four orders of ministry are what? No, <laughs> Lay people, bishops, priests, and deacons. Four orders of ministry. Every person in the church falls into exactly one of those categories. Well, actually, no, they don't. Each one of those, everybody in the church falls into the baptismal category. Some in the church who are baptized fall into the diaconal category. Some deacons fall into the priest category, and some priests fall into the bishop's category. Okay? So everybody's in those, and you are in an order of ministry. All those other words that you said are your job titles. And so I am a priest. My job title is rector of Church of the Holy Communion. When I was in Virginia, my job title was associate rector of, Church of, of St. John's Episcopal Church. I was still a priest, but it was a different job title. Um, Hester has moved through job titles like nobody's business since she's been at Holy Communion. Uh, she started as curate, which is a word that we have that sort of indicates a training time. Then she was associate rector, and now she's senior associate rector. Her priesthood, her order of ministry remains the same, but her job title has changed. Does that make sense? What else? Questions? Thoughts? Rosemary. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it is not normative for a deacon to preside at worship. What's the reason for that? The bishops ordained the priests to do the sacramental functions. They did not ordain the deacons to do that. They ordained the deacons to be the servant ministers of the church, carrying on the church's mission forward. So Randy does not have the authority to go and celebrate the Eucharist. If he's going to um, officiate at a service, it's going to be a rare event, and he's going to use sacrament, bread and wine, that either Hester or I have prayed over before, or the bishop, because he doesn't have that authority as a deacon. It's a division of roles. Randy's role is to carry on the work of the church in the world. Hester and my role and Benjamin's before uh, he went on to Virginia is to uh, administer the sacraments, and the bishop's is to give guidance to the wider church. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was also very irregular. So for the 10 months before I arrived at Holy Communion, there were no priests here. Randy was it. And that's very irregular. It's very irregular. Dottie. Yes, uh, but those two things are disconnected. So Eucharistic ministers are lay people who have received a special license from the bishop to assist the priests with communion. And those are the vested folks that you see on Sunday mornings with the chalice. <clears throat> uh, they don't do a whole service. Uh, they have a special service that they can do as they take it out. Um, baptism is a different matter, and I, I don't want to lose my time on that, but we can come back to it at the end if you're still interested. Okay? Carol. Okay, monks and nuns are a different category. Uh, some of them are lay people, and some of them are ordained. Um, and, a monk and a monk or a nun is a member of a religious community who's taken on special vows of, um, usually it's obedience, poverty, and chastity, I believe are the core ones from St. Benedict's rule. Um, somebody who's taken on special vows, special disciplines of faith, and agrees to live within the context of a religious community of people who've had similar vows. Um, some of those people are lay people, some of those people are ordained, so it's a different question. Um, many are lay, but if you remember Joseph Wallace Williams, who is the associate rector at Grace St. Luke's, he is now in New York at the Order of the Holy Cross, uh, living in their monastery. He remains a priest, but he's taken on the vows of a monk 
again, this idea of vesting, taking on additional responsibility. Rihanna. <coughs> It's a good question. So Rihanna says, some deacons move on to be priests and some don't. How does that happen? Uh, that's a conversation that you enter into before you get ordained. So this is not the sort of church, uh, and there are churches like this, where you raise your hand and you say, brother, I feel the call. I feel the call. And then we ordain you. Uh, we don't do that here. <laughs> um, no, we don't, <laughs> do we? <laughs> the, um, the ordination process in the Episcopal Church starts with one person saying, I feel called to ordain ministry. Then it expands to two people, usually that person and their priest. And then once they've agreed that a call exists, it expands to the community of the congregation. And then once they believe that a call exists, it expands to the community of the diocese. And then ultimately it's the bishop's final decision. Um, so we have this, this sort of expansion, and in that process, you will discern whether or not you're called to be ordained a deacon, a permanent deacon, a vocational deacon, or whether you're called to be a transitional deacon, which means transitioning between lay, layperson and priesthood. And so you declare that in advance. Um, I declared in advance, I feel called to the priesthood, my community agreed, and I went through that process. Randy declared in advance that he felt called to be a deacon. His community agreed and that he will not ever move on. You do. You do. It's transitional. You're here for a short time. Or vocational. You're here forever. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Meredith. Yes. There you go. Easy question. <laughs> Our nuns are some of my favorite people. Um, all right, so these four orders continue on to modern day. Where did they come from? Uh, when I was a, a child, I had a lot of Mormon friends. And my Mormon friends asked me one day, what was the source of the church's authority? I'm like, well, rats, I don't know. <laughs> 20 years later, I'm still thinking about it. What is the source of the church's authority? And the source of the church's authority and the understanding of the Episcopal Church is the bishop. Why is it that the bishop has that authority? Because he was in what's called apostolic succession. Apostolic succession. There is St. Peter up at Caesarea Philippi. And he makes his confession to Jesus. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Jesus said, some say that you're the prophet, some say that you're Moses, some say that you're Elijah. And Jesus says to him, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God. And then Jesus turns to him and says, you have answered rightly. And truly I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Is this familiar? In that moment, we believe that Jesus gave to Peter cosmic authority. Peter was given the authority to bind things on the other side of the divide. He was given permission to forgive sins on the other side of the divide. What you do, Peter, will count. It doesn't have to be me. And then we believe that Peter went on to ordain other people to lead the church. The Roman Catholics call Peter the first bishop, uh, the first pope, the first pope. And he goes on to ordain others, and they go on to ordain others. And we get this chain of bishops all the way back to St. Peter. And the idea is the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand touched Peter who was touched by Jesus. Um, if you go to see, when you see Bishop Johnson around next time, ask him what his number is. What's your number, Bishop? It's, you're not making a pass at him, I promise. It's not that sort of thing. In the American succession, every bishop has a number, and that number reflects what bishop they are in the sequence back to Samuel Seabury, who was our first bishop, as we discussed two sessions ago. 
Um, Bishop Johnson is probably somewhere in the 800s, the middle 800s, given how long he's been ordained. We're currently in the 1100s uh, of bishops. So that's his number of sequ sequence coming down from Samuel Seabury, who was number one. Samuel Seabury was ordained by bishops in Scotland who had their own succession that goes back from there. They were probably ordained by bishops in England, which has its own succession going back to the Reformation. And then those bishops have a succession that takes them back to Rome. And those bishops have a succession that takes them back to Jesus. So there's this unbroken chain of the apostles going all the way from Jesus to Don Johnson. Bishop Johnson ordains Hester and gives to her the authority of the church, and then she exercises it on his behalf. I was ordained by Bishop Mark Sisk in the Diocese of New York. I continue to exercise that ministry on his behalf, but only with Bishop Johnson's permission, because this is his territory, his region. Does that make sense? This is the source of the church's authority. That's why we call ourselves Episcopal, because we look to that leadership. Your friends in the Presbyterian church do not have this system. They don't observe it. It's not critical to them, because they think, they believe, that the church will raise up elders from within itself. And those elders for that community will get together and take counsel for the area, for the region, and they'll make decisions, and that'll be fine. But we don't hold that. We hold that there's a divine commission coming down from Caesarea Philippi that gives our bishops and by extension their priests and their deacons the authority to do cosmic things. Why is this important? Jesus promises us that he will meet us in the sacraments. We can meet Jesus anywhere, but if we're having trouble finding him, the place where he promises that he will be every single time are in the sacraments, principally in Holy Eucharist and baptism. And when you come into the church and you sit down and you're having one of those hard days of faith and you look up at me and I take bread and wine and I say the words of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood, now sanctify these gifts, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit. They may be for us the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. It's not me. It's ancient cosmic authority that has been by grace shared with me. It's not me standing up and saying, this is what I think. This is what I've come up with. This is how I read the scripture. It's this idea of tradition, that third leg of the stool, that we have this tradition that leads us here. It also puts us in communion with everybody who's come before. It's communion. It's communion between you and God. Co-union. That's what the word means. But it's also communion with everybody receiving around you. And it's also communion with everybody in every age who's come before you and has received communion in that way with those words. It's all those saints who are buried in the columbarium that we remember on All Saints Day. It's them. It's being in communion with them and with the people who came before us and with Bishop Seabury and with everybody who came before him and everybody who came before him and the whole communion of people all the way back to the apostles. It's an amazing thing that becomes rote too quickly. The apostolic succession. Questions or comments? Meredith. Um, the, uh, come next Thursday, on Monday, Thursday, listen to the words. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this when you need to remember me. Yes, that is. I think that's Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's also cited in the Gospels. Or, excuse me, Corinthians cites the Gospels. Um, Monday Thursday gives us the John's Gospel, which is the foot washing, and First Corinthians, which is Paul's recollection of the Last Supper, so that you can do both in your preaching. But it's that. It's when you need to remember me, do this. Do this. Think about that for a moment, if you will. When you say, well, where's God? Where's this? Where's what? God is telling you, when you're having trouble remembering me, do this. He's already answered the question. 
I told you that the bishops gave us authority, but they didn't give us complete authority, right? There are three things that a priest can do that deacons and lay people cannot do. There are three things that a priest can do that a deacon or a lay person cannot do. Rosemary has already identified one of them, and what is that? Yes, can't consecrate, can't consecrate, can't make the common holy. That's reserved for us. What else? Absolve, forgive sins. That's reserved for us, for bishops and priests. What's the third one? Nope, not baptism, not marriage. It's connected to marriage. It's blessing. This action. You'll not see Randy do this. You'll not see Randy use the word bless. You'll hear Randy pray with you. You'll hear Randy pray using us language. You'll hear Randy asking God to bless. But you'll hear Bishop Johnson and Hester and me actually blessing. Because we had that commission from Peter. ABC. Absolve, bless, consecrate. Those are the only reasons I have a job, by the way. And I appreciate my job. Um, all of the other stuff you can do on your own. Dottie, you had asked about baptism. Baptism is not up here. Um, we believe and hold that it is normative for baptism to be performed in a church setting on certain days, under certain circumstances, with certain documentation. But in emergency situations, anybody, any Christian can baptize another Christian. It's not normative, but it's absolutely acceptable. And even the Roman Catholics who take these things more seriously than anybody else, even they accept that. Marriage. Marriage is a really interesting one. As this is where the church and the state have become so intertwined that we can't find our way out of it anymore. Um, this, in this country, we believe in the separation of church and state. Yet I, as a religious leader, in my capacity as a religious leader, can sign marriage licenses which create legally binding obligations for the couple. Right? Um, Jessica and I got married in December. We had to go down to the clerk of court and get a license to bring to Bishop Johnson for him to marry us and sign it, and then he had to send it back to the court, right? Isn't that interesting? A civil court authorizes the Bishop of West Tennessee to do something on its behalf, and then he has to report it back to the court in a country that celebrates the separation of church and state. When I do somebody's wedding, I tell them at the rehearsal, I have two functions tomorrow. One is to sign a document for the state. The other is to pronounce a blessing. And that's all that I'm doing. Y'all marry each other. Y'all make the promises. The whole congregation prays together. But I have the unique role on behalf of the state of Tennessee to sign some paperwork. And I have the unique role on behalf of the church to pronounce a blessing. And that's what Randy can't do. Randy can sign the state's documents, but he can't pronounce the blessing. Uh, Randy can baptize in the same way that a lay person can baptize, not normatively, but in, under certain circumstances. You'll not see Randy do a baptism here. That's not his role. But in the same way that you could under exceptional circumstances, so could Randy. Great, so unction is one of the sacraments of the church, one of the lesser sacraments, it's prayers of healing, and is not one that's reserved for priests except insofar as it's forgiving sins, absolution, or pronouncing a blessing. So prayers for healing, which I would honor, which I would suggest are the sacrament, uh, are not reserved for us. All right, so we've got these priests, uh, and they're up there, and we're coming in. Uh, to, we're coming in to worship, and it's one of those days where I'm having a little trouble finding Jesus, and Jesus has um, promised that he's going to meet me in the sacrament. So we come on into the church, and then Sandy's up there, and he presides the Eucharist, and I take the bread and the wine, and I feel the presence of Jesus in myself, and then I realize that Sandy's heart ain't right. 
Sandy got a call from the bishop just before he walked into church, and he didn't have kind words in his heart for the bishop calling him about something insignificant right before church. Sandy's heart is not in the right place. He's not thinking good things. Sandy's up there saying, gosh, how am I going to balance this budget? How am I going to do this? I can't believe that that person just said that thing to that other person. And then you start to realize, "Uh uh-oh, he was the one who did the thing. And then you start to say, "Uh uh-oh, he was the one who baptized my daughter. And what if he had gotten that nasty call just before then and he wasn't thinking about the thing and he wasn't focused? Oh, my Lord. The whole thing is falling apart. My daughter is no longer baptized. The, I'm, the Jesus that I'm having inside of me. This, so when you're thinking this, this is our last one, heretics beware. <laughs> heretics beware. Donatism. Donatism. Donatism is the belief that the validity of the sacrament depends on the condition of the heart of the priest. Donatism is the belief that the validity of the sacrament depends on the condition of the heart of the priest. And our good old friend St. Augustine said that's rubbish. The priest is there as what we call a hollow vessel. God is working through the priest as a physical representation, but it's not in fact the priest. Therefore, The condition of the heart of the priest at the time is not relevant. What's relevant is the working of God through that priest and the faith with which that sacrament is received. Donatism. That's our last one. I think we've done like five of them as we've gone through. Anything on the orders of ministry before I just do a little hierarchy for you? Ah, Good question. So Lauren's question is, has the church always ordained everyone? And by that, she means with regard to race or gender or sexuality, etc. The answer to that is an absolute flat stony no. Absolutely not. Um, We have gone through about 200 years of evolution on this question just in the United States. Um, The first African-American was ordained to the priesthood. His name was Absalom Jones uh, in... Somebody help me out with Absalom Jones. I think it's like 1860, 1870, somewhere in that neighborhood in, in Philadelphia. Um, the first women were ordained to the priesthood in 1974, I believe, and then it was canonically authorized in 76, give or take a year or two in there. Um, I don't know the first uh, gay or lesbian person. Or the first gay or lesbian bishop was in 2003. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a quite an evolution. The first female bishop was Barbara Harris, 88? 80, 88 or 89, somewhere in that neighborhood. So we have seen a remarkable evolution of the diversity of the priesthood and the episcopate and the diaconate over the last 50 years, um, and a, a really remarkable one over about 150 years. That's the quick answer to the question. It's a good question. So within a diocese, bishops set direction. So bishops decide who can be priests in their diocese. Who decides about the bishop? And we're going to come to that in our diocese in just a little while. Um, Who decides who's going to be the bishop? The bishop is elected in our system uh, since Samuel Seabury in Connecticut by representatives of of the laity of the church gathering together with all of the clergy of the church. So in West Tennessee, we'll use Holy Communion as an example, Um, Because of the size of this church, we have six lay delegates to the diocesan convention. Uh, I can't rattle off their names right now, but they're sort of long-term parishioners who have been elected by the vestry to represent us at convention. And they will go, and they, together with the representatives of all the other congregations, will be the house of laity. And then Hester and Randy and I will show up, and together with all of the other priests and deacons of the diocese will be the house of clergy. And we will then elect a bishop. And we have to elect the same person on the same ballot in order for there to be an election. So if the lay people say, we want John Smith, and the uh, clergy say, we want uh, Jane Jones, there's no election, and we have to go and vote again. And we keep working on it, and keep working on it, and keep working on it until we're done. Once that happens, we'll then send a letter out to all of the other dioceses in the church and say, look, we've just elected a bishop. It's John Jones, and we're so excited to have this person coming to be our bishop. How does that feel to you? And elected representatives in each of the dioceses need to approve, and the bishops need to approve. 
So you need to get a sign-off from a majority of the diocesan lead committees, called the Standing Committee, and a sign-off from the majority of the bishops. And once we have that sign-off, then we can proceed to ordain a bishop. So your question was, does that mean that New Hampshire can have a gay bishop and West Tennessee cannot? It doesn't quite work like that. It's who is elected in that place, and then is the wider church willing to offer consent to that election. Does that make sense? I think the latter, um, the, uh, and we'll, let me modify the word protest to say out of deep concern for what those people felt and were seeing. Um, it is a, each diocese, each diocese has the responsibility to elect its bishop, and the wider church has the authority to consent or to not consent to that election. And many of the people who left uh, in that time or who were the most upset in that time we're very disappointed that the leadership of the Episcopal Church consented to that election. We've only had a couple of those. Uh, we had one in um, uh, uh, South Carolina that the diocese then re-elected the same person uh, and then consent was given, which surprised me. Uh, we had one in northern Michigan uh, where consent was declined because we weren't entirely sure that the person believed in God as we understood it. Um, and that seemed to be a pretty fundamental issue for the House of Bishops. Um, so uh, the, every now and then you'll see one of those, but if, the, if consent is not received, the diocese has to elect again. And that's the, that's the safeguard. Helpful? All right, let's uh, clarify some of these words that I've been using here. The fundamental base unit of the church is what? What, what? Layperson, those are the orders. Uh, we're talking about the organization of the church. The parish church. The parish church. Technically, a parish is a geographical territory. We don't do that quite so much in the United States. It's still the law in England. But the idea is that I am the rector of this parish, which would extend as far to the, in that direction as St. John's territory, would extend as far in that direction as St. George's territory, and as far in that direction over there as All Saints, right? So I'm the sort of rector of this region, this little tiny region in Memphis, and we call that a parish. Um, realistically, it means the people who come to church in this building uh, on Sundays. A, bishop, a parish church is led by a rector who is an ordained person in collaboration with a vestry, which is an elected body. Okay, so you elect your vestry, I am the rector, and the vestry and I have relatively balanced powers. When it comes to worship, I'm the final authority. They, they advise me, but I'm the final authority. When it comes to money, I advise them, and they're the final authority. And so we do this little dance. The vestry calls me with the bishop's approval, and then I become the president of the vestry. So it's just this really intricate dance that rectors and vestries do together. Parish churches are grouped into regional organizations, which are called dioceses, diocese. It doesn't look like it, but this is pronounced diocese. Throw an E on the end, it becomes diocese. Diocese, diocese. Dioceses have a diocesan bishop, a clergy person, and a diocesan convention which is elected lay representatives of each congregation and all the clergy. See the pattern? Dioceses are grouped into province. Province, thank you very much. Close to region. Province. Our province is the Episcopal Church. Our province is the Episcopal Church. In England, the province is the Church of England. In Scotland, the Church of Scotland. What is it in Trinidad and Tobago? Tobago. You're in with the Church of England. So every, every diocese is grouped into a province. And each province has someone at the top, either an archbishop or a presiding bishop, and then a governing body. Ours is called the General Convention, the General Convention. And again, it's patterned in the same way as diocesan convention. It's elected lay and clergy representatives as one house, and then the House of Bishops, all the bishops. And in order for actions to be taken, both bodies need to disagree on the same language, just as a check against one another. 
It is not the sort of church where the bishop can say, I want this to happen, and that's it. There are safeguards against that. There's mutual discernment to be shared. The General Convention meets every three years. This is the year. Um, I'll be there in the first part of July. I'll miss you terribly, and I assure you that I'd rather be here with you preaching the Word of God rather than doing these sorts of things. Um, but they will gather, and then you'll see lots of news coming out. You'll see lots of actions taken um, following that. And then the province is gathered in together to the communion, our worldwide Anglican communion made up of, I think, 37 provinces around the world. And our head of the Anglican communion is the Archbishop of Canterbury. What I'm going to offer to you is that things get a lot looser as you go up the chain. The Archbishop of Canterbury has absolutely no authority in the Diocese of West Tennessee. The presiding bishop has very limited authority in the Diocese of West Tennessee. Bishop Johnson has a great deal of authority, and I have a great deal of authority here. So as you go up the chain, things get a lot looser. The parish is the number one focus of ministry of the church. This is where we preach and teach and have Sunday school and youth group and cookouts and all of those things that connect us with each other and with God. The diocese is the principal focus of authority in the church, setting the regulations, set, establishing the boundaries. The province and the diocese, excuse me, the province and the community are fo focuses, foci of unity in the church. Unity. It's how we draw together and find identity with one another. But as you go higher up the level, you have less authority. It's not the hierarchical system that you imagine it would be. Who remembers back to their uh, civics training? You gentlemen might be in this right now. Um, and the Articles of Confederation. Heard of this? It was the document that preceded the Constitution of 1787. What was different about the Constitution of 1787 and the Articles of Confederation? Federalism. Federalism. The idea that the federal government would trump the states on certain issues, right? Under the Articles of Confederation, that wasn't the case. States would send delegates. Those delegates would be restricted to vote in the way that their state legislatures uh, told them to vote. And decisions could only be made by consensus. So if one state didn't want to do it, it didn't happen. That was in effect in this country. I don't know when the articles were written, but they were in effect until 1787. The General Convention met for the first time in 1785. That was still the way that America governed itself. And in a lot of ways, we never updated. We don't have federalism in the Episcopal Church. We have a lot of dioceses with a lot of independent authority, and we work together on certain issues. But the authority is all down here at the bottom with us. There's no judiciary in the Episcopal Church, no way to sort of mediate between conflicting opinions. And there's no strong executive. The presiding bishop provides uh, ceremonial leadership, provides unity for the church, disciplines bishops when there's bad behavior, but has really very little authority to say anything about what we do in that room over there. Bishop Johnson has a great deal of authority over it. I have a great deal of authority over it. The vestry shares, with me, shares authority with me in keeping the lights on and the staff employed and all of that. But the presiding bishop has very little to do with it because we still have this idea of 110 dioceses forming a loose confederation, not a federal government. Helpful? All right, last slide. We're going to put some names with these people. Your parish church is what? Let's say that a little more robustly, please. And it's a great time to be at Holy Communion, is it not? And your senior clergy person is me, and my title is rector. Rector derives from the Latin word rex, which means king. We're going to remember that. <laughs> that that's absolutely true. Um, somebody once said to me, Sandy, I'm worried about people who go into ordained ministry because of the power it conveys. I've been ordained for 35 years, and I have never had one day when I felt powerful. Um, you know, that sort of thing. All right, and our, so our parish is Church of the Holy Communion. Our rector is the Reverend Sandy Webb. What's our diocese? Diocese of? Which is a geographical region. Dioceses are geographically bounded groupings of congregations. 
Diocese of West Tennessee. And who is our bishop? And what is his clergy title? There it is. Say it loud and proud, Lauren. Say it loud and proud. The right reverend, indeed. The right reverend. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. He is our diocesan bishop. Our province is the Episcopal Church, and our clergy leader for the Episcopal Church is Michael Curry, and his clergy title is presiding bishop is his job title. What goes in front of his name? The blank reverend? Nope. The most reverend. The most reverend. And then our communion is called the Anglican Communion. And our clergy leader for the Anglican Communion is whom? Justin Welby. And his clergy title is? Archbishop of Canterbury. And his clergy title is? <laughs> the Most Reverend. The Catholics have a different system, so don't be confused. Don't be confused. The Catholics have a different system. In our tradition... Deacons and priests are the reverend. Some deacons and priests serve in special jobs. If you're a dean of something, dean of a seminary, dean of a cathedral, dean of a college, dean of a region, uh, you are the very reverend. If you serve on the bishop's staff or work down at the cathedral, you are the reverend canon. But those are just sort of add-ins, right? Bishops and priests are the reverend. Excuse me, deacons and priests are the reverend. Bishops are the right reverend, the right reverend. It's an old English term. A member of the House of Commons is called the right honorable so-and-so. And so it just conveys over to those bishops who are members of the House of Lords. The right reverend is a bishop. The most reverend is an archbishop or a presiding bishop. So the most reverend is one of those bishops who's at the top of one of the provinces. And Archbishop Welby, in addition to being the focus of unity for the Anglican communion around the world, is also the head of the Church of England. Brianna. Yes. Right. So, Rihanna has asked a question and has identified the one singular exception to the rule. Thanks. <laughs> If your job title is canon, which means that you're either on the bishop's staff or you're on a cathedral staff or you've been given that title as an honorarium by the bishop, in addition to that being your job title, it also goes in your clergy title. But that's the absolute only exception. Ah, oh, that's a very good question. How do they decide what the region should be and when you need a new one? So uh, back in the day, uh, in the early uh, Episcopal Church in 1785, there were nine dioceses represented in the, the nine little crosses in the blue field at the top of the shield, and they were all bounded by states. They were all bounded by states. And as new, dioceses, new states were admitted to the Union, so two new dioceses were established. And so from, I have no idea when the Diocese of Tennessee was established, but until 1983, the Diocese of Tennessee was one diocese for the state. And in the United States, it tended to be that way. And in 1983, leaders of the Diocese of Tennessee, including a number of people from Church of the Holy Communion, said, this is insane. The bishop is in Nashville, the cathedral is in Memphis, and we are also serving congregations in Bristol. How far is that? 500 miles across on this narrow little state? Whereas we've got these three distinct regions, the three great divisions of the state of Tennessee, uh, everything about the government is organized according to those divisions. They're culturally different from one another. Let's split it up. And so in 1983, the Diocese of Tennessee calved off the Diocese of East Tennessee and the Diocese of West Tennessee. The way that happens is by an action of the General Convention. So the General Convention decides who's a diocese and who's not a diocese. In fact, a lot of the old-timers in diocese and leadership today will say, back when Tennessee was the whole state, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, we know. Go on. <laughs> what's, what's next? But yes, yeah, so that's still remembered here, is that um, we are the Episcopal Church west of the Tennessee River in the state of Tennessee uh, and have only been so since 1983. Nashville is the headquarters city or the sea city for the Diocese of Tennessee. So you've got West Tennessee... 
in neither. You've got West Tennessee, Tennessee, and East Tennessee. There are three. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip my last slide and just offer a little time for questions. But this is who we are. We have the same Bible as everybody else. We have a unique way of interpreting that Bible. We have a unique history of putting together people from different perspectives and different backgrounds. We have a unique way of worship, and we have a unique way of organizing ourselves. And I spent one session on each one of those uniquenesses, and those are the things that set us apart as Anglicans and Episcopalians. We're different from Presbyterians in the way we worship, in the way we interpret Scripture, in the way we came to be, in the way we organize ourselves. We're different from Methodists. They broke from us. We're different from Lutherans. We have a different heritage, different history. This is us. This is us. That's right. The, hist the, the history there is a little bit complicated. Uh, what is your, your Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago? So the Diocese of Church of England. So, Diocese of Trinidad and Tobago is your diocese, and it's within the province that is the Church of England, which is under the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, Anglican means of England, right? That's what that word means. And so, the Anglican Church and Anglicans are those who are the daughter churches of the Church of England. In the, in the United States, largely, there are some exceptions, but in the, in the United States, that is the Episcopal Church. Um, in Scotland, it's the Episcopal Church of Scotland. Um, in uh, the Sudan, it's the Anglican Church of the Sudan. Um, so it's just different history, different words chosen. You've got to be a little bit careful in the U.S. right now because uh, in some of the recent divisions that we've had, um, in some of our, over the last 35 years, 40 years, we've had division over the prayer book, we've had division over the ordination of women, We've had division over the ordination of gay and lesbian people and then the marriage of gay and lesbian people. So all of these have caused division. And usually when someone breaks away from the Episcopal Church, they will say, the Episcopal Church has left the historic teachings of the church. We are truly Anglicans. And so you've got to be just a little bit careful uh, around here in how you use that word. Um, I'm not actually familiar with the Anglican churches in town, but if there were some church that broke away from the Episcopal Church, they would say, we are Anglicans and you're Episcopalians. I would say, we are Anglicans and Episcopalians. I would further say that they are in the Anglican tradition because they worship according to the prayer book. They organize themselves in the way that Anglicans organize themselves. They lay claim to the same history and heritage, but they're not in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Does that make sense? Low church and high church are within us, and it's just a different way of worshiping. Um, and I will, uh, that would take a whole class in itself, <laughs> which would be a fun class, by the way, but we'll save that. I bet it was a higher church in Trinidad and Tobago than here. It would be my... I, I thought... <laughs> yes. What else? Scott. Yeah, so here's what we've got. So we've got... The Anglican Communion, with all of her daughter churches, of which the Episcopal Church is one. Then you've got break-off churches that have left over whatever issue it is. And they have left, and then they've tried to organize themselves. And they've organized themselves in a number of ways. And there's a whole alphabet soup over there that I really don't understand. One of the largest divisions is the Anglican Church in North America, ACNA. Another division, which I think is headquartered in New Zealand or something like that, is the Anglican Church in America, ACA. Then there's the Anglican Province of America, APA. Then there are the uh, local dioceses that the churches in Africa have set up within the United States, and they're claiming lineage to the Archbishop of Canterbury, saying that my church is under the authority of the Archbishop of Sudan, who's under the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it just gets very, very confusing. So the Anglican Church in North America is one of a large group of um, people who used to be Episcopalians. Well, so here's the thing. So if you're going to claim Anglican heritage, you've got to have a bishop because the whole system is built around it. And just like Samuel Seabury, 
in 1784-5, that bishop needs to be ordained by other bishops. And if you're going to say, um, uh, John Smith, you're now going to be the bishop of this region, somebody's got to ordain him. And so if you look back in the breakaway history, particularly in Virginia and other places, you'll see bishops coming over from Africa to ordain people here because that was the only way you could get a bishop. Yes. Yeah. Fort Worth, Quincy, and San Joaquin all broke away from the church and Pittsburgh. The, um, the legal question... Well, um, so that this is where it gets complicated. <laughs> Um, if we weren't complicated already. And I'll actually tell you, the most knowledgeable person on these matters in West Tennessee is Andy Cobb, who's the bishop's attorney and a member of this parish church. So if you would like to ask questions about this, Andy would love to talk to you about these issues. But where I'm going to go and just stop there is that we have had whole dioceses say, we are no longer a part of the Episcopal Church. And that's a tough thing. Our conception isn't that dioceses can do that. The General Convention establishes what a diocese is. And what that has led to is a lot of legal fighting that has gone as far as the Supreme Court in several states, but hasn't been taken by the Supreme Court of the United States, about who owns the property. If you choose to leave, do you get the property or not? If you individually choose to leave, you get nothing. You can go wherever you want. You can give whatever you want to anybody you want, but you don't get to take with you anything here. What if we as Church of the Holy Communion said, we're going to leave. Oh, and we're going to take this building with us. Well, this building wasn't built by us. This building was built by people 65 years ago, many of whom aren't here, and who gave money to the Episcopal Church. If you're in the Diocese of South Carolina, they're going back 350 years in Charleston, pushing on 400 years. You can't go and ask those people who gave that money what they thought. And so far, in general, the courts have said that money given to the church is given in trust for the church. Individual people can leave whenever they want. Priests can leave whenever they want. But the property belongs to the church, except in a few individual state and circuit cases. That's really technical. What else? Oh, it's a very good question. What other communions is the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church in communion with? Um, I'm going to answer that on the provincial level, so for the Episcopal Church. We are in communion with the Moravians, and we're in communion with the Old Catholics, and we're in communion with the Lutherans, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Lutherans. And what we mean by full communion is their priest can stand behind our table, and I can go and stand behind their table and lead worship. The Methodists are up next, but we're having issues with apostolic succession. They don't really care, and we kind of do. The Lutherans, by the way, agreed to respect apostolic succession so as to be in relationship with us. We said that we couldn't do it unless they would agree not to ordain priests by anybody but a bishop. And they agreed to change their protocol and make sure that there was always a bishop present for every priest's ordination. We are not in communion with the Presbyterians, and it's very unlikely that we ever would be because their understanding of the sacraments is completely different from ours. It's, it's a very, very small sect uh, that has nothing to do with Rome, and they call themselves the Old Catholics. But those are the only three. The only sign that I have seen in Memphis for the Old Catholic Church is at that uh, Disciples of Christ Church at the corner of McLean and Peabody. And um, they have a little banner out front that says, St. Francis Old Catholic Church meets here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. Um, so they've entered into a relationship with that church to use their space, but I know nothing about them. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mormons are a whole different matter. <laughs> a whole class in themselves. <laughs> that I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath for communion with the Mormons. <laughs> Friends, I love teaching this class, um, and I love the folks who come back and do it time and time again, and I love just telling our story. Uh, so thank you for this privilege and opportunity. Um, for those of you who are feeling uh, that God's doing something in your heart, I'd like to say that we have a lot of opportunities to do something with that. Um, if you have not been baptized, I, it would be my thrill and delight to baptize you. Um, thrill and delight. If you have not been confirmed in the Episcopal Church, um, the bishop is coming on April 22nd, and this class is preparation for that. I need you to sign up with Elizabeth, which you don't have to do tonight, but just sign up with Elizabeth. 
If you were confirmed in another church, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, Lutherans, the Catholics, um, and you, uh, but you want to become an Episcopalian officially, we call that being received into this church, and the bishop does that as well. And let's say you're like me, and this is the water that you've swum in all your life, swam in all your life. You were baptized as a child, you were confirmed as a teenager, and there you are, and you kind of think you're done, but you feel that God is stirring in your heart and saying, this is new, and this is a time when I want to recommit myself to the principles of my faith and open a new chapter of my life. Um, when, if you're feeling that, we have an opportunity for you to reaffirm your baptismal vows in the presence of the bishop, and he'll lay his hands on you again and say those prayers again. We're not redoing your confirmation but acknowledging that at different points in our lives, we have these reset buttons. Um, and if you are interested in any of those things, I'd be delighted to talk to you about it. And Elizabeth is the keeper of the register. Um, and you are completely prepared by having participated in this class. Any last words? Amen. Amen. I like it. Thank you, Don. <laughs>